All right. Hello, everybody. This is the Evergreen Community Reports Interest Group Meeting. And today we're going to be talking about learning SQL and um, some of the basics of, of writing in SQL and, and using that language. Um, and we've got with us Rogan Hamby, Hamby from Equinox and Chris Sharp from Georgia Pines. Uh, if you guys would like to do longer introductions of yourselves, you uh, feel free to do that. Um, but if not, I will hand it over to you. And I'm Jessica Wolford. I am the convener of the reports interest group. Um, this will be one of my last ones until I go out on maternity leave, if you weren't aware of that. And then Elizabeth Davis will be hosting y'all for a little while. Um, so and uh, we'll we'll be we'll be talking about some other stuff over the next the course of the next few months, uh, but today is all about SQL. So I will go ahead and hand it over to our guest speakers now. I really don't have a need for additional introductions to you, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. I mean, I, I will say um, that uh, by way of sort of background, I, I am. Um, I've been the Pine System Administrator since on and off since 2008. Um, and very early on learned how to get into the database and sort of see the table relationships and things like that. Um, and because of a, a, a staff departure, I ended up sort of inheriting reports for a number of years as sort of my responsibility. Um, and my knowledge of the underlying SQL, SQL, I, I say SQL typically, but it's tomato, tomato, um, uh, has given me a lot. It gave me the missing ingredient for understanding how evergreen reports actually work uh, on the front end. Um, and of course, there are some things you can't out of the box anyway do in uh, evergreen reports that you can just write a query and have your results. So having some sort of database access is, is really a good thing. So that's all I'll say. Yeah, I'll echo some of that. I was working at Evergreen Library, uh, started with version 1.2, and which was multiple iterations of the reporter ago. And if there's anybody else here other than Chris and I who used it back in 1.2, you would know that essentially the only way to get useful information out of it back then was to do giant dumps of just about everything and then try to clean it up in Excel. Um, <laughs> it was very limited. Uh, and yeah. the reporter is much different thing now. In fact, we have two of them. We love them so much. Uh, and, but there's so many things that you cannot do effectively in the reporter. Mm -hmm. So... SQL is useful for that, and it's just good for understanding what Evergreen is doing. It's useful also for troubleshooting. You know, sometimes people will say, well, well we don't understand what Evergreen is doing here. I say, well, I mean, ultimately, all Evergreen does is read, manipulate, and store data. So if you know where Evergreen is storing it and what it has to store, that can be useful for troubleshooting. So... We have a presentation here on SQL joins. Uh, my plan was just to kind of go through it and let Chris interrupt and correct me when I say something wrong. And does that sound like a workable plan, Chris? It does. All right. So let's go ahead. Uh, it says the host has disabled participant screen sharing. Oh, no. OK, uh, <laughs> let me figure that out. <laughs> That's all right. I will say, uh, as we before we jump into this, while Jessica's uh, figuring that out, that I mostly constrained myself to talking about joins, but I did cheat and sneak in one fourth little topic because I do think it is very relevant when we start talking about connecting sources of information. You should well, be all set now, but uh, yeah. proceed. <laughs> okay. And I, I will give you the spiel I usually give in a longer SQL course. 
and let it sort of percolate with you. I don't expect it to actually mean anything to you today necessarily if you haven't done a lot with SQL, but one day it, it becomes a eureka moment. And that is my examples here are mostly about tables. I'm not gonna talk about views and other things, but when you talk about working with data in SQL and querying it, it doesn't care what your data source is. It's a table, a view, or anything else. All it cares is that it's tabular data and it has identifiers for what, if we visualized it, we would think of columns. That's all SQL cares about. So you can join together all kinds of things, tables to subqueries, to views, to um, temporary tables, to other stuff. SQL just doesn't care. But we're gonna mostly talk about tables today. And the four things, we're gonna talk about our inner joins. These are your bread and butter. These are the ones you use all the time, even if you don't know of them as inner joins. Outer joins, which two versions of you'll use pretty commonly. The third, not so much. Cross joins, which I actually saw somebody using a cross join. They had it organically for a natural purpose the other day. And I thought they won SQL bingo. Uh, <laughs> Cross joins are very rare. I, I think I've used them not even a full handful of times. Mm -hmm. And then CTEs, which are very useful uh, and provide an alternative to subqueries that I think a lot of people find more intuitive than subqueries. But we'll talk about that at the very end. It's not a type of join, but it's something you join with. So let's start with inner joins. Now, inner joins are pretty simple. Are you uh, meant to, have... to be sharing, Rogan? Sorry. Oh, I am meant to be sharing. Did it not share? Sharing is caring. <laughs> Let's try that again. Yay, I can see that it now. Works. Okay, we have it now. All right. So let's jump into the inner joins. These are the ones you're going to use all the time. Uh, if you just type join with nothing else, you're doing an inner join. So you're probably using them and have seen them even if you don't know it. And conceptually, they're very simple. Both sides of the join have to match. They have to be the same data type. They have to be the same data value. That means that if on one side you have a string that says gone with the wind, and on the other side you have a string that says gone with the wind, and then an extra space at the end, they no match. Now, there are things you can do to make them match. You know, you can do some normalization and make them both lowercase, uh, use something called a B trim to take the space off the end. So you can manipulate the data while you're matching. But inner joins must, by when they do the comparison, have the same value on both sides. And this is the most common join you're going to use. Uh, you can go, I can probably go weeks with this being the only kind of join I use. So let's do a scenario and step through some actual examples. In this scenario, you want to do a simple query to see how many members there are in your permission class. This is something you could do in the reporter, but it's also the kind of task that's so quick and easy to do in SQL that if you're comfortable with SQL, it's actually faster to do in the database than it is to sit down and build a whole report template for it. Now, I'm relatively UI agnostic. I don't care what people use so long as it works for them. I'm a psql user. And if you do a backslash D actor.user, you get some useful information in psql. A lot of other tools out there, however, will give you the same information in other ways. Um, PG admin, last time I used it was pretty good and exposed this easily as well. And that's a popular open source GUI for Postgres. Yeah, I, I can I can recommend PG Admin as well. Um, that's when I first started learning this part of the database. That was extremely helpful um, because it both showed the the actual queries that define the tables mm -hmm. and constraints and all that stuff. And it also yeah. gave me a visual of how those uh, relationships existed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and these relationships are what joins are all about want to know what matches with what. And that's why I'm bringing this screen up. 
And if you look at the actor.user table, you get to see that one of the things that it links to uh, is, its, well, that links out of it is its profile. There is a column called profile on actor.user. It is an integer. It cannot be null. Everybody must have a profile group. And if you then skim down further below that, you'll see this thing called actor user profile F key. And then it says foreign key. Foreign key is the thing that tells you, hey, this links to something else and it must be a valid value in that other table. So that is a reliable 100% of the, almost 100% of the time link, unless some weird database shenanigans have happened. <laughs> And then it even tells you it references the permission dot group tree table and the ID column of that table. So we know that this is a safe join to make between actor dot user column profile and permission dot group tree column ID. Right, and the, the the key part of knowing that you want you want an inner join is that uh, not null field, and that basically right basically means you're um, you're working with data that has to be there. Like, you know, a person may or may not have certain fields in their user profile, but the profile has to be there. And so you're right. safe to use an inner join. And there may be cases where it's nullable and you still want an inner join, mm -hmm. but you definitely should ask yourself the question at that point. Do you want null values or not? If you don't, then an inner join is safe. And let's just look at the top example first and I'll just kind of read it out in rough English. Select a count of everything and then also give me the group name. Pull first from the actor.user table and then join to the permission group tree on the group tree ID equaling the actor user profile, just like we talked about. And then a group and order body. And that will give you a simple count on the left-hand column of the numbers of patrons in those groups and the name of the profile group on the right-hand side. And then just to demonstrate below is the exact same query. Now, instead of typing join, I have inner join there. But if you run the two of those, they will give you identical results. Postgres just assumes that when you say join, that it's an inner join, it does not need the additional term. But it's there for SQL standard compliance purposes. And these are real queries you can run on a live database yep. if you want to experiment, and they will not destroy your data. <laughs> no. This, this, I have done, there are no updates here and no right. crazy huge joins. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the, the whole fear of I, I'm going to break my server or something like that. There are definitely select queries that can get complicated enough that it uh, puts a tax on your, on your report server. But, you know, these, these simple select queries, they're not going to do any harm. Nah. If you do have a reporting server that's like a read-only server off your main database, that's even better to use just on general principle. You know, you don't one day want to not be thinking about it and suddenly do a bunch of queries on something like Auditor that slow down your main system. Right. Um, but these will be pretty safe. So let's think up a scenario here. And in this scenario, a uh, staff member, this is, has actually happened to me. A staff member has been filling out notes about holds placed by a dependent on a guardian's record with the hold ID. So they literally are their nephew or whatever it was, I don't remember now, you know, has put a bunch of holds, they go in, look up the holds, take the hold ID and make separate notes on the ant's record with. Now, this is an interesting situation because you want to find these and clear them out, but you have a text field on one side representing an integer in the database on the other side. Remember, we said they had to be the same, but I also said you can manipulate the data if you need to. So here's an example of that. 
we are actually looking at the action.hold requests table and matching up the messages from it to the values of the act of, uh, yeah, I think I caught, turned myself in a circle with my tongue there. <laughs> matching up the action hold request IDs to the values of the messages in the actor user message table. Now, when you normally do, and this is enabled by two things. One, this AUM.message casting to an integer. By manipulating it here, this now becomes an integer, even though it's a text field, to compare to the action hold request ID. However, normally if you do this, when you hit a value that is not transferable to an integer, say an English word, the whole query is going to fail on. And that's where this little filtering down here becomes relevant, where it says where aum.message. And I won't explain this to people, but it's basically what's called a regular expression. And it says the entire content of the field is an integer, translates cleanly to an integer. Now, in practice, you're probably not going to be converting text to integers too much. I gave this as an example because it surfaced in my memory from long ago. But doing things like, say, you're comparing two titles in different places, and you're not maybe one person capitalized and another person didn't, so making them both lowercase or trimming off spaces from the beginning and end, as I mentioned before. Those would be common things you do to manipulate the values when you're comparing. Does that make sense? Jessica looks thoughtful. <laughs> oh, she's reading her email. Don't worry about it. No, I'm just listening. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's move on to outer joints. Now, outer joins are kind of a mixed bag, and at least I find that a lot of how I use outer joins is based purely on habit and style preference. Um, and I'll talk about that in a second. But as Chris mentioned earlier, you can have data missing on one side, it can be null, and that's where outer joins come in handy. This guy's twin just disappeared. It's probably a <laughs> plot line from Supernatural there somewhere. That's I, right. I missed the last few seasons. <laughs> yeah, so so for a real life um, example from reports, like I'm, I'm assuming people on the on this in this meeting are probably troubleshooting reports on behalf of their libraries. And they're like, it's not like it's giving me what I know what the results are right, but it's just not enough results. Like I know there's more data in there. And if you have done an inner join where you needed an outer join to allow for those null values, that is a very common problem. Very common, yeah. So a left join is different from an inner join in that the data can be different on one side, but only different in being missing and being that null value. So let's talk about a scenario. We want to review user messages for personally identifiable information concerns, but also want a list of all patrons uh, to mark off that don't have messages. So we're reviewing messages again here. And here's the query. Now, in a production database of any size, this is going to give you a ton of results, but for a small system, it's pretty manageable. And what this does is it says, hey, we're going to look at the actor user table and we're going to join to the actor user message. But we don't want just those patrons that have entries in actor user message. We want to see when they don't also. We want to, you know, see a whole list of them. And maybe somebody's come to you and said, I want a list of every patron, and if they have messages, those messages 
listed beside. And that's what this would do because we're doing that left join. Left here means on the left side of the equal sign. So we have left join actor dot user underscore message AUM, which is a uh, uh, alias, alias for the table name. On so you don't have to keep typing out actor user message every time. It, this right. is a, a nice shortcut. And then on, of course, just like we did with the inner join, the keyword to say that this is the link coming afterwards. And then that value link defined by the equal sign on the left side of it, that's the value affected by that left keyword, left join. So what you are saying is that value, aum.usr, user, can be null in this query. So you're going to get all those first names, all those family names, and then only if they exist for that user will you also get a message title. Because the, on the left join, the left side of the equal can be null. Does that make sense? Yeah, an another way of thinking about it is I want all the data on the left, even if there's not data on the right in for that column. So like bring me all the all of the columns back, even if this field isn't populated on the right side or or on the left side, sorry. Yeah. In this case on the left side. Yeah. 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 Now down below. I've done another illustration here. Uh, you don't have to specify left outer join, but if you do, again, for compliance with SQL standards, it will act exactly the same as if you write left join. In my experience, most people just type left join unless they have a habit from another flavor of SQL that actually requires it be specified, which some do. Um, I will say that I usually use left joins, not right joins, simply because I find it easier to structure and type them that way. Right. Because I'm making nullable the thing that I'm listing right there. And because I'm consistent about it, it makes it easy to skim and read my own code. If I go back and forth using right and left joins randomly, then I have to think more about what I'm reading. And thinking is clearly a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> one, one way to think about it, and this is true in the reporter as well, is if you find yourself doing all these crazy joins to get to the data that you're actually looking for, you're probably starting with the wrong source. Like you've got the wrong, the wrong tables on the left. Um, yeah. But there are also in the reporter some situations where you want the, the right join um, I guess that's the child nullable. Is that correct? Yeah, the child yeah. nullable inside the um, reporter. Um, you know where because may, maybe the linkage inside the reporter is not very firm, and you have to get to that data somehow, and you have to do it through the reporter because you have to be able to give this to a library so they don't bother you again. <laughs> so anyway, right? Yeah. And usually it doesn't take that many hops to get from one source of data to another. Right. And if it does, you, you're in trouble. Yeah, yeah. You, you should probably rethink it. Again, thinking now, is bad. Yeah, thinking yeah. is bad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Elizabeth Davis asked, like with a stat cat, I want all the entries even if they're null. Yeah, stat cats are a good example of something where you'll want to account for nullability. Absolutely. Yeah, because there might be a stat cat. Right. And anytime uh, you're like, well, there might be one that's, you're, you're going to have to account for that with some sort of outer join. I think, Unless you just don't care about where they're null. I, mean, I think by right. default in the reporter, the stat cats are joined via a left join on like item and yeah. user. But um, well, your the, mileage the way, may vary. <laughs> the, and and just, just a quick aside, the, the way that's defined and the way you would know for sure is actually looking at the fieldmapper.xml file. Right. Um, 
and in that it defines the relationship it'll say has a or it says might have and things like that so you, you can actually go check what the reporter is probably going to do and it usually does the right thing yeah for those who aren't familiar with um, the field mapper it's often called the fm dot fm idl dot xml uh, it if you're at all intimidated by reading an xml file don't be it's just structured tables. And if you have some familiarity with doing queries and, and Postgres table structure, once you sort of get used to how that file looks, you'll just kind of go, oh, this is just an XML representation of SQL relationships, which is really all it is. And, you know, hey, we're giving aliases to tables and we're saying where they're going to link out to and all that. And uh, as Chris said, if you use the reporter and you've ever wondered, well, why does it link from here to there? It's because it's defined in that XML file. And it's really useful to troubleshoot reporting sometimes. Okay, so let's look at another sample query for a count of how many patrons that have never placed a hold. Now, why am I doing showing you this one? I'm showing you this one because it's a neat little trick. Now, our first one, our first query at the top is kind of how it's traditionally done. I want to know who an actor used, how many patrons have never placed a hold. So select a count of them where their ID is not among the users of the action.hold request table. However, there's a reason you don't want to do this. Does anybody know why offhand? I need the Jeopardy theme music here. Do, 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 do. Okay. Uh, because it can be painfully slow. Postgres, uh, Postgres's not in implementation is notoriously slow. Some recent versions of Postgres seem to have improved it a little bit, but you could end up sitting there way longer than you think you should have to. Now, down below, however, we have the same thing using a left join. So instead of not in a subquery, we do a left join to the hold request table and we have on that left nullable part, ahr.user. And then we say as a filter where HR user is null. So we just look for the null values. We actually can say, I only want it where it's null. And that is by orders of magnitude faster than a not in. It is shocking how much faster it is on most versions of Postgres. I have seen queries that sat there for five plus minutes using a not in that finish in seconds using a left join and isolating null. So that's a good little trick to use. And of course, if you for some reason wanted to use the second query and specify uh, where ahr.user is not null, You've basically artificially nullified the left join and functionally made an inner join out of it. <laughs> yep, you can use exists as well. Did you want to talk about that for a second, Chris? I can't hear you, Chris. Testing. There you are. OK, sorry about that. Um, yeah, I, I was just going to say that exists is an alternative that's, um, to my knowledge, faster in general. Um, and um, I, I'm realizing I, I, I'm missing a closing parentheses on my uh, query there. But anyway, the, um, the exists, what that's doing instead is it just that select one might look kind of funny, but that's just select true. It's, it's really just sort of if if the if the row matches bring it back 
Um, and, and that's that's a simpler thing to do rather than the more complicated not in, as far as Postgres is concerned. The exist query looks more complicated, but Postgres sees the other one as more complicated. It has to do with the way it plans queries. Yeah. And exist is a useful tool um, in general. There's a number of places it can be useful. Yeah. And this is probably a good time to mention the phrase Tim Toady. If you've never heard of it, it's an acronym. It basically means there are many ways to do the same things. And sometimes the difference between them is cosmetic. Sometimes there are, you know, minor situational differences that come up with them. And if you ever get to the point where you're starting to investigate query planning in Postgres, um, you, could, you, you can end up down a very deep rabbit hole <laughs> analyzing queries, <laughs> mm -hmm. sometimes questioning by the end of it if it would have been faster to just sit there and wait for the long running version. <laughs> yeah. So let's reverse that message query a little bit. So we at the top, I have the left join version again. At the bottom, I've just flipped it to have the exact same effect, but using a right join. Again, we want the message to be nullable. So now the message is on the right-hand side. If you took these two and ran them, uh, side by side, you'd get the exact same results. So that's all a left versus a right join is. Which side is nullable? And I mentioned before that the outer key term is entirely optional. So this is another example of that. Again, you can run both of these and you'll get the same results. A right join is a right outer join. A left join is a left outer join. Uh, I don't think there's any such thing as just an outer join, though, unless that's an alias for a full outer, but I've never tested that. But full outer joins are the next thing to talk about. Now, I really struggled when I was working on this to think of a functional, reasonable example of a full outer join. So I thought, well, let me just, you know, query the source code and grip through it and find one. Uh, and I found that in, an art, in, in the folder of SQL source code for Evergreen, there's only one full join in the whole thing. <laughs> that gives you an idea of how they're not used a whole lot. So I don't want to spend a whole bunch of time on this when they're not, you know, very practical. But... I did, for the sake of the presentation, grab that uh, from the source code, and it's for a funding view, uh, the acquisitions funding source balance, uh, where it makes sense. You want to see everything on both sides. Right. But I'm not going to belabor the point because I don't want to potentially confuse people over something that you are very rarely going to use. So I will say that if you find yourself in a situation where inner joins and left and right joins aren't working because you need nullable values on both sides, then a full outer join is probably the answer and you can look up more details on it when you hit that point. And by that point, you're likely to be very comfortable already with the other kinds of joins. And that brings us to cross joins because we wanted something even more rare than full outer joins. Uh, and cross joins, the data can be different. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. Yes, I'm a geek. Uh, <laughs> well done. And you may be thinking to yourself, uh, what is the use of a join where the data on the two sides can be different? And the answer is when you want every possible combination of something. So in this case, let's say you wanted to make a list of org units and profiles, then this will do that for you. And you don't do an on statement with a cross join because you don't care about those values. <laughs> you're not really comparing anything. You're just saying, give me everything. 
In this case, it will literally list every org unit short name with every profile group name. If that does not seem terribly useful to you, it doesn't to me either. But you can go a very, very, again, I think I've used a cross join maybe three times on projects. I've never That's used it. it. I've never done a cross join. Yeah. So they exist. Don't worry about them. <laughs> CTEs. Now, this is something really useful. Now, this isn't a kind of join, so I have kind of abused the uh, uh, goal I was given by Jessica to go a little bit further here, and I won't go, spend a ton of time on them, but they're so useful, I felt like I had to bring them up. They're not joins, but you will want to join them, to use them with your data. And I was trying to think of how to explain what a CTE is, and I just thought of the dude. You know, there's a lot of ins, a lot of outs. I think it's easier to show you in practice than try to explain in theory what a CTE is. Uh, a CTE stands for a common table expression. I think of them as with statements because the most common form of them start with the stick with the keyword with. And if you're familiar with subqueries. They can be used like subqueries, but since, as I will show you in a second, they're kind of outside your main query. They can let you structure things a little cleaner and easier to read. Also, they have a functionality that uh, subqueries do not, and that they can be executed in pre-processed data before the main query. CTEs are executed in order that they're listed in your code. So you can pre-calculate things for your main query. You can even create CTEs that manipulate data that are used by later CTEs. And that probably all sounds a little cryptic, so let's just look at it in practice. So this query is looking at circulations for people. And it's a very simple example because I started to build a fully practical circulation query and then it ended up pulling in so many fields it was just this huge blob of text on the screen. So we're gonna stick with the simple version. And I said that I think of CTEs as with statements a lot because they start with this with. With followed by an alias for your data Remember I said before, Postgres doesn't care about tables and views and whatnot. They just want tabular data. And so you're basically creating something that you could think of as like a temp table, a temporary table. Now, Postgres has a thing that actually are temp tables, and there are some technical differences here, um, which I don't need to get into. But I think this is a cleaner way uh, than temp tables most of the time. And here I am saying, I want the user ID. I'm using a coalesce statement, which if you're not familiar with coalesce, basically you give it a list of values and it will use the first non-null one in the list. So if they have a preferred given first name, it'll use it. If that field doesn't have a value in it, it'll go to first given name. Then it does the same thing for the family name. So I'm getting the user ID, first name and a last name. And it's basically building a table of these. And I could do multiples of these with statements, just separating them with commas. And then after that, a normal query, except now I can reference names that, whoops, that CTE as if it were a table or view in the database. So this would give me uh, first name, last name, and the checkout date of circulations in the database. So now, that's, you that's, could... one, that's one query I would not paste in the results to on, you know, the public internet. <laughs> not, not on, yeah, yeah, not, not on a production All the database. people in your database who have circulated anything. So anyway, yeah. uh, 
this is a better query for a test database. Um, if you wanted, if you needed this as output, you could output it, but I wouldn't run it in the middle of the day. <laughs> yeah, so so one, one thing to know about the way Postgres works uh, in probably all databases is it has to build the query in RAM. Like it has mm -hmm. to actually run and get all the data you're asking for and it sticks it in memory. And if you have a large enough set, it will actually run out of memory. <clears throat> and, and Postgres is very resilient. And if it if it sort of dies from an out of memory area, uh, error, um, it will uh, it, it'll restart gracefully, but you will no longer have Evergreen connected anymore. So another reason to have your reports on a separate uh, database than your production. Yeah. And there are some ways around that, but even the sure. ways around it have their downsides. So, yeah. But I wanted a simple example of showing a with statement uh, where you can reference the data in a follow-up query. And in this particular case, this data does not need to be processed ahead of time for the main query. So you could integrate all this into one query, but it might make it a little harder to read. Oh. So it depends a little bit on your preferences. In my case, I probably would have done this all as one query, but I, at this point, have a lot of practice eyeballing raw SQL code. And that brings us to questions, discussion. You're even welcome to throw tomatoes since this is through the internet, and they won't actually hit me. Yeah, throw them at him. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, I, I, I wanna add a couple of things. Um, sure. In my own experience of learning SQL to um, do troubleshooting for reports, I imagine most people in this group have at least peaked at the generated SQL and the, the debugging area of reports. And that, if you if you use something like, you know, PG Admin or you know your your SQL editor of choice, um, you can just paste this into the window. You know, copy and paste it into the you know the prompt, the window, the text editor, whatever you're using. Mm -hmm and run it as is and see how it goes. And you can actually like start, you can comment out things um, in the query with, uh, with, with SQL, that's with a double uh, dash sign. Um, you can change the joins on the fly uh, mm -hmm. to see if that makes a difference. Um, you know, keep in mind that the query is gonna run just as slowly as it did for reports if it's one of those big ones. But yeah. it's it's very useful to be able to do that. Um, so uh, recommended SQL editor. I I don't uh, beyond just something that allows uh, syntax highlighting, so you don't get into uh, you know obvious errors and traps. Yeah, uh, something with syntax highlighting is nice. There's a lot of text editors with some form of syntax highlighting out there now. Uh, I think on Windows, Notepad++ offers plugins or something like that for it. Uh, on the Mac side, I use TextMate a lot, which is a good one with syntax highlighting, also open source. Um, I wanted to mention about the SQL debugging. I agree with Chris on his points. Uh, additionally, sometimes people find reading the SQL debugging code hard because of the aliases it provides. It needs to be able to potentially have a very high number of duplicate table names uh, because you can reference, say, actor.org. I mean, I've written reports where I reference actor.org unit like 10 times in one report. So it uses these pseudo-random uh, aliases, which can be hard to read, but you can go in there and say, hey, I'm going to do a fine replace for this 10 character long string with uh, ACP for asset copy. 
and that kind of thing. And if you do that, you'll suddenly find it much easier to read an eyeball. Right. And, you know, sometimes the tables are joined more than once on top of each other. You'll see copy join more than once for certain queries, things like that. Um, you know, and so I end up doing like ACP one, ACP two, sure, that kind of stuff to just sort of keep track of where the fields are coming from. Um, that, by the way, is usually a sign of a bad, badly constructed template, meaning somebody went too deep into the tree to sort of create it. Um, but, uh, you know, that that's pretty obvious when you get to the generated SQL. But yes, I always do a find and replace of the, the yeah. long hash strings um, because it, you know, it's just not readable otherwise. I've, I've actually considered writing a script that would just do it for me or like a BIM <laughs> plugin or something like that, but I, I've, I've not gotten around to that. Yeah, and as Chris said, most of the time, if you're having multiple asset copies, something's gone wrong in the structuring. There are other cases where it's more common, um, org unit, you're doing holds reports, you may want one join out for the pickup location, one for where it was placed from, request location, and so on. So some are more legitimate than others. And some more real life examples of why you would be using SQL instead of the reporter for certain things. Um, one is some of the examples Rogan gave uh, with subqueries, anything with a subquery is not possible in reports. Um, obviously CTEs is the same deal. And when, you get, when you're getting fancy, <laughs> you, you, you're probably looking at doing it uh, manually, um, but that's also part of the, the, the challenging fun. But um, so like, you know, there's a report I could probably, th that's another thing you can do. Like, so if you do come up with the perfect SQL query and you keep running it and like more and more libraries are asking you for it and you're having to like run it all day and that suddenly becomes your job, that is when you start thinking about making that a source in the reporter and that right. you could do a whole other presentation on that at some point and you may have already done it, but um, you, you can take the query, turn it into a view, or run it inside the field mapper and, and access those files or access those columns that you've created that are so useful for you. So yeah, that might be a good future topic for the leaders of this group to do an um, example. July. <laughs> oh, is Taren, it already? Taryn oh, okay. is on the docket to uh, to show us how to do that in July. <laughs> oh, go Taryn. Okay, cool. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Thank you, Taryn. <laughs> Yeah, I was just thinking maybe um, maybe I'll dust off my PG admin for uh, and maybe we can do that as a uh, sorry my dogs are about to lose it um, we can we can do that as a um, as a, as a potential session and and let me throw on an addendum uh, to that about expanding through the field mapper. If you find, you know, a combined source that's a really valuable view and you're finding yourself going, man, this is so useful. We want it in the field mapper. We want it in the reporter. Consider filing a launchpad ticket. Other people might find it useful too. Yeah, when it, whenever we come up with one that I think is sort of generally applicable, I do run it through the bug tracker so that we can contribute to the upstream project and actually benefit everybody. An example is the, um, I did one a, f a few years ago that's, um, I actually was trying to do it in answer to the, um, the uptick of like collection HQ type, you know, third party things, but there's a, a copy statistics view that I created and, and stuck in there. It's sort of buried in the sources, but if, if you go down and find it, it, it's actually got some really good useful information in there. Tips on sorting. Sorting by call number is an interesting challenge because not all call numbers sort the same and some have some very finicky rules, but it is doable.
Do you have any additional thoughts on that, Chris? I was I was typing out my little response. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, basically, in like most of the stuff in cataloging is manually entered somewhere along the line, and that creates right. lots of errors. And that's where the the functions that Rogan was mentioning at the beginning about you know B trim and you know so some of the maybe playing with the cases or or you know uppercase lowercase um, everything so that it's all matched all normalized um, but yeah any, any, anything a human being touches is going to be non-standard um, so mm -hmm. yeah like in pines we our database predated the prefix stuff for call numbers so sure we have the prefix in the label and you know we, we could we could make a project where whatever's you know the first letters followed by space becomes a prefix but you know at this moment we can't really sort by call number for that reason so it'll you know all the mysteries will be in the m's regardless of author for instance yeah it's very situational if you're using prefixes and suffixes then sorting by those as separate fields becomes easy <laughs> If you right. have a predictable pattern, like, you know, hey, we're we're only looking in this report situation at fiction, and all of our fiction starts with certain um, character codes for mystery, horror, whatever, then you can do some things in SQL where you split the string and you treat that as a separate value, and then, you know, sort independently. Um, and that's the same basic technique you'll use if you get into more complicated sorting. But once you get into SUDOCs and LCC, uh, a bunch of these other sorting schemes, they can become very particular in the edge cases. Right. And so clarifying that there's a sort key field that should be helpful for this. Should be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's right. It, well, if they have been set correctly. <laughs> so for people who are interested in following up on this and have access to an evergreen database, it doesn't necessarily have to be your, you know, actual database on production. If, you know, we have several test servers out in the community that somebody might be willing to give you access to, I don't know. Um, really, I, I think if you're interested at all, you, I mean, you can install Post Postgres on the computer you're using right now in some form yeah. or another and create a, a test database of something and start messing with it. But really I would recommend um, getting to know your data that will help your report creating skills far better. So like the fact that Rogan and I off the top of our heads were like, eh, call numbers, you know, that's because we have had to do this for a long time and we know how those, how those fields work. And we know that, yeah. you know, anything with Mark, anything with, you know, manually entered statistical categories, anything like that is just going to be non-standard. If you don't believe me, run a report on county names in your database and you will see all of the different <laughs> ways people spell Douglas or whatever. Um, Some will surprise you. <laughs> yeah, or, or not after a while. But yeah, it's, you know, I, I'm actually surprised when they get it right. But, you know, it, it learning to deal with real life data, I think is a, a fascination of both Rogan and me. Um, Cause it, you know, we are like the exceptions actually make it fun. You know, it's sort of like figuring out how to, okay, now we've got this big pile, this big messy mark record set. And now we have to figure out how to translate into that into something a computer can actually read, which is funny because mm -hmm. it's machine readable cataloging, but um, yeah. So gone are the days of punch cards when that would have actually worked. Yeah. And I will mention, uh, Chris mentioned installing Postgres on your machine. You absolutely can. I've installed Postgres on both Windows and Mac laptops. And you can actually pull down the evergreen source code and install the uh, what we call Concerto database directly then in that Postgres on your desktop and play with it. And for those who don't aren't familiar with Concerto, it's more or less the test set of data we use. There's some history and debates there about whether or not it was supposed to be, but it is at this point. <laughs> <laughs> 
thank you guys. This was great. <laughs> I definitely learned some stuff that I'm going to be I'm going to be applying. I always mean to de, uh, dig into the WIP statements and the CTEs a little bit more, um, but I've I'm very comfortable with subqueries, so I think I'm going to have to uh, you know try and challenge myself to do a few more different things when uh, when the time comes. <laughs> you usually, yeah, I, usually I, I learn. Go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, you know, sometimes uh, with statements can be useful troubleshooting too. Sometimes. Mm -hmm. I'm doing a query and it's not working the way I think it should. So it's like, you know what? Let me just take some of these subqueries out, make them into CTEs, and that'll make my main query more compact and easier to read and publish. Mm. Right. And what I was going to say was you um, you end up hitting a wall on something you're trying to do and you're like, okay, there has to be a way to do the thing I'm trying to do. That's when you end up doing things like coalesce yeah. and things like sub you know sub queries that are that get complicated and then you realize oh actually a cte would be a better approach so that that's it's it's very iterative it's not like you know you you get into this and suddenly you're you're walking talking expert on common table expressions you know you yeah you you, you learn in an iterative way just like everybody else yeah. and right you know starting with the simple uh, select queries and then the more complicated ones from our reporter i think that's a good way to actually get going and get your hands dirty Mm -hmm. um getting to know this stuff yeah i found that um as i've gotten more comfortable with it i'm I'm much more comfortable also like just doing a google search on like i'm trying to do this <laughs> and then hey absolutely like... <laughs> uh, i have learned many a trick from stack exchange over the years no shame <laughs> right same here yeah same here well thank you for the invitation Thank yep. you guys so much for for accepting. This was really really great. Um, we'll post sure. the recording and so that you can. That I'll I'll definitely be watching it again. I think. <laughs> um, and uh, and yeah, thank thank you guys so much, and thanks to everybody who who came out. Um, and we'll be meeting again the last week in July. Wait, no, what month is it? It's May. Still <laughs> the last week in, in June. And Stephanie will be joining us to talk about usability in the reporter, which is also very exciting. So thank you, everyone. And ha enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.